Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome back to KMI Community Connect viewers. Uh, today, uh, we are actually talking uh, uh, something different. Uh, this is more like a, a question and an answer. In fact, it's only one question. Um, but this is actually in continuation of our uh, previous topic that we talked about body types based on insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. And um, uh, if people who have uh, missed or the viewers who have missed uh, this uh, particular topic, uh, uh, please uh, look forward uh, for the link that we have um, and uh, uh, for the same uh, presentation that we did uh, previously on our last topic. So the, the question that came about, uh, since this is more like an answer to the question that uh, was asked more than one time uh, by some of our uh, curious uh, proactive health seekers. Um, the, the question was about insulin resistance. So uh, this term insulin resistance uh, uh, gets thrown uh, uh, with the uh, such uh, ubiquity um, that uh, to define this is actually more uh, uh, complicated um, and also we can give all kinds of uh, explanations but it gets more tricky in terms of uh, giving a proper uh, definition and explanation. But uh, before I talk anything more about uh, this term insulin resistance. I would like to acknowledge uh, Professor uh, Gerald uh, uh, Rivens, um, the Emeritus Professor from Stanford, uh, for his uh, phenomenal contributions uh, to insulin resistance. He is uh, uh, a brilliant scientist, a brilliant academician, a scholar, um, and also a professor of medicine uh, with um, uh, incredible work and uh, some seminal publications on uh, insulin resistance. So uh, what is the question that uh, got asked more than one time uh, uh, when I did my last presentation is uh, how can I know that I am insulin resistant before getting diabetes? How can I know that I am insulin resistant before getting diabetes. So this question is uh, uh, a very uh, compelling question and for this reason um, I had to kind of take a detour from my original thought and sequence of presentation to talk more about uh, the storage of uh, energy and how energy is stored. So since uh, uh, this is what I am going to talk about today about um, that question that uh, uh, many had asked me. Um, I put uh, the, the answer pretty much lies in what I um, kind of presented to do here in colors. It's a spectrum. Uh, if you look at the path of progression of any disease, this is more a trend or path to diabetes, uh, which specifically means uh, talks about insulin resistance. So this, the green that I said is in the wellness part that I represented, the lighter green, dark green, lighter green, and then a gray zone, yellow, orange, um, and then a little bit more orange and red, and then completely red. So in this path to uh, the regression to disease, I would not want to call it as a progression since it's a disease. If you see from green to red, um, you could, uh, pretty much uh, see how it transitions over a period of uh, years and years that you know how we can intervene early. So from a, a general perspective to get to the answer for that question, if you just look at the glucose value which is a snapshot at a moment or at a point of time, you will not get many answers. That's what we generally see because you don't know at the back end what is happening. But uh, for all simple reasons today, um, if we can add one more testing, which is a fasting insulin that you could do uh, in your, in your uh, physician's offices, 
you could get a little bit more information and uh, that is kind of um, uh, I would say nearly uh, accurate uh, to get a little bit more uh, detailed information even though it is still a snapshot of insulin at one time so what is that so to know that if you are insulin resistant you get a fasting glucose and a fasting insulin and you multiply fasting glucose by fasting in time with fasting insulin and divide it by this number 405 so the number that you get if you are in the healthy range you would be about uh, optimal value would be about up one which would be between 0 0.5 and 1.5 uh, 1 1.5 and if if somebody is in the early insulin resistant uh, stage then you would be at uh, greater or equal to 1.9 and if the insulin resistance is significant, then it would be somewhere around greater than 2.9. So if you see here, I have put in that this gray transition zone, this early insulin resistance, where you could see the numbers hanging around 1 to 1.9. And then when you go a little bit more into around 2, 2.9, you call it as pre-diabetes. And then obviously the question of once you have diabetes, you we know that it's already insulin resistant so we really this uh, calculation would not be of much significance because we already know that the patient is uh, or somebody is diabetic so why is this uh, so important because when you look at this transition from wellness to illness in this area about um, i'll give you a few numbers about in the united states about um, 35 to 40 million people, which is about, uh, uh, I would say, one-tenth of United States population are diabetic. So, one in ten uh, uh, are diabetic, but about 88 or 90 percent of the population, which is all coming from here to here, are pre-diabetic. Which means, one in three, about 80 mil 88 million, 90 million of adult population are pre-diabetic and 90% of them don't know that they are pre-diabetic. So this question is a very profound question and it's a very compelling question to give answers for this. So uh, the pre-diabetics early intervention is the uh, cornerstone um, and also um, because if you look at it from progression if you want to address uh, the uh, delaying the onset of mortality you have to address the delaying of onset of chronic disease which means you have to address the metabolic dysfunction so the metabolic dysfunction starts here the, pre the insulin resistance the early insulin resistance significant insulin resistance the pre-diabetes and then to leading to diabetes um, so um, the the way to do that is there are more tests that you can do. I have just given a snapshot of quickly assessing whether somebody can be insulin res is insulin resistant or not. But a better test that we do because if 90% of the population uh, that are uh, pre-diabetic don't know, uh, one in three are pre-diabetic, um, it is very, very important that early intervention with some testing is crucial. Here at uh, uh, KMI, we actually do this uh, testing which is very routine. We just not only do the fasting glucose and fasting insulin, we actually add another uh, test to it which is we challenge the um, person with by giving a glucose load and then we check uh, the sugars uh, two hours after that uh, and also the insulin after that. What it checks is actually the disposable and utilization of glucose and how much the insulin the person is making based on that we can tell more accurately um, uh, about the, whether the person is insulin resistant or uh, is in the normal range so this test is actually more dynamic than a static test that you do but for all practical purposes uh, to answer this question immediately if somebody has to know just adding an insulin to a fasting uh, glucose will give you at least some kind of uh, uh, idea. Now, so uh, uh, after this uh, part, um, I actually would like to um, kind of uh, emphasize on uh, the early intervention and uh, also 
the take home points from this is diabetes is not a problem of glucose. I repeat, the diabetes is not a problem of glucose. The adult diabetes, I'm talking about the type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is a problem of insulin. Again, diabetes is a problem of insulin. So, the abnormality or the dysfunction that we talked about to answer that uh, profound and a beautiful question that uh, I got asked after presenting the, uh, my previous presentation um, is uh, very important for all of us to know. Uh, and uh, with uh, having said that, I would like to go back on my next presentation to the normal uh, of how energy and glucose and how um, the metabolism starts because it's very easy and it's very important for somebody to understand the normal before we go into abnormal because how the what happens to glucose what happens to fat what happens to the energy perceived whether it is somebody who's a diabetic or a pre-diabetic or whether who's somebody who's overweight or weight how it differs from a normal metabolism from a normal person with normal healthy uh, profile. Um, so, thank you very much. I acknowledge the uh, the people who have asked and raised this question today, um, and I would we'd also welcome more questions on our YouTube uh, channel uh, so that we can do more of this question and answer uh, uh, discussions and sessions. Uh, thank you very much. I will be seeing you very soon to discuss my next topic on storage of energy very soon. Thank you.